today, the March 12th, 2021 day, I'm going to read to you from the book Women Who Run With the Wolves by Clarissa Pinkola Estes. Page number two. The wild nature passed through my spirit twice, once by my birth to a passionate Mexican Spanish bloodline, and later through adoption by a family of fiery Hungarians. I was raised up near the Michigan state line, surrounded by woodlands, orchards and farmland and near the Great Lakes. There, <clears throat> thunder and lightning were my main nutrition. Cornfields creaked and spoke aloud at night. Far up in the north, wolves came to the clearings in moonlight, prancing and praying. We could all drink from the same streams without fear. Although I didn't call her by that name then, my love for wild woman began when I was a little child. I was an estate, estate, aesthetic, rather than an athlete. athlete. And my, I'm Dutch by the way, so some words in English are a bit difficult. My only wish was to be an aesthetic wanderer, rather than chairs and tables, I preferred the ground, trees and caves, for in those places I felt I could lean against the cheek of God. The river always called to be visited after dark. The fields needed to be walked in so they could make their rustic talk. Their rustle, they make their rustle talk. Fires needed <clears throat> to be built in the forest at night. And stories needed to be <coughs> stories needed to be told outside the hearing of grown-ups. I was lucky to be brought up in nature. There, lightning strikes taught me about sudden death and the evanescence of life. My slippers showed that death was softened by new life. When I unearthed Indian beads, fossils from the loam. I understood that humans have been here a long, long time. I learned about the sacred art of self-decoration with monarch butterflies perched atop my head, lightning bugs as my night jewelry, and emerald green frogs as bracelets. Hmm. A wolf mother killed one of her mortally injured pups. This taught a hard compassion and the necessity of allowing death to come to the dying. The fuzzy caterpillars, with, which fell from their branches and crawled back up again, <coughs> taught single-mindedness. Their tickle walking on my arm taught how skin can come alive. Climbing to the tops of trees taught what sex would someday feel like. Mm. My own post-World War II generation grew up in a time when women were infantilized and treated as property. They were kept as fellow gardens, but thankfully there was always wild seed which arrived on the wind. Though what they wrote was unauthorized, women blazed away anyway. Though what they painted were unrecognized, it fed the soul anyway. Women had to beg for the instruments and the spaces needed for their arts. And if none were forthcoming, they made space in trees and caves, woods and closets. Dancing was barely tolerated, if at all. So they danced in the forest where no one could see them or in the basement or on the way out to empty the trash. Self-decoration caused suspicion. Joyful body or dress increased the danger of being harmed or sexually assaulted. The very clothes on one's shoulders could not be called one's own. It was a time when parents who abused their children were simply called strict, when the spiritual lacerations of profoundly exploited women were referred to as nervous breakdowns, when girls and women who were tightly girdled, tightly reined and tightly muzzled were called nice, and those other females who managed to slip the color for a moment or two of life were branded bad, 
So like many women before and after me, I lived my life as a disguised creature chura, creature. Like my kith and kin before me, I swagger staggered in high heels and I wore a dress and head to church. But my fabulous tail often fell below my hem line and my ears twitched until my head pitched at the very least, down over both my eyes and sometimes clear across the room. I've not forgotten the song of those dark years, Ombre del Alma, the song of the starved soul, but neither have I forgotten the joyous canto hondo, the deep song, the words of which come back to us when we do the work of soulful reclamation. Like a trail through a forest, which becomes more and more faint and finally seems to diminish to a nothing, traditional psychological Psychologic, psychological theory too soon runs out for the creative, the gifted, the deep woman. Traditional psychology is often spare or entirely silent about deeper issues important to women. The archetypal, the intuitive, the sexual and cyclical, the ages of women, a woman's way, a woman's knowing, her creative fire. This is what has driven my work on the wild woman archetype for over two decades. A woman issues of soul cannot be treated by carving her into a more acceptable form as defined by an unconscious culture, nor can she be bent into a more intellectually acceptable shape by those who claim to be the soul bearers of consciousness. No, that is what has already caused millions of women who began strong and natural powers to become outsiders in their own cultures. Instead, the goal must be that retrieval and succor of women's, women's beauties and natural psychic forms. Fairy tales, myths and stories provide understandings which sharpen our sight so that we can pick out and pick up the path left by the wildest nature. The instruction found in story reassures us that the path has not run out, but still leads women deeper and more deeply still into their own knowing. The tracks we all are following are those of the wild and innate instinctual self. I call her wild woman for those very words, wild and woman, create Lamaro tocar a la puerta a fairy tale knock at the door of the deep female psyche. Lamar o tocar a la puerta means literally to play upon the instrument of the name in order to open a door. It means using words that summon up the opening of a mad passageway. No matter by which culture a woman is influenced, she understands the words wild and woman intuitively. When women, <clears throat> when women hear these words, an old, old memory is stirred and brought back to life. The memory is of our absolute, undeniable and irrevocable kinship with the wild feminine. A relationship which may have become ghostly from neglect, buried by over-domestication, outlawed by the surrounding culture, or no longer understood anymore. We may have forgotten her names. We, we may not answer when she calls ours, but in our bones we know her. Where was I? Um, We yearn toward her, we know, the, we know she belongs to us, and we to her. It is into this fundamental, elemental and essential relationship that we were born and that in our essence we are also derived from the wild woman archetype. Sheaths, sheaths, the elf. Oh, 
I'll start again. The wild woman archetype shields the alpha matrilineal being. There are times when we experience her, even if only fleetingly. And it makes us mad with wanting to continue. For some women, this visualizing, this vitalizing taste of the wild comes during pregnancy, during nursing, they're young, during the miracle of change in oneself as one raises a child, during attending to a love relationship as one would attend to a beloved garden. The sense of her also comes through the vision, through sights of great beauty. I have felt her when I see what we call in the woodlands a Jesus God sunset. I have felt her move in me from seeing the fishermen come up from the lake at dusk with lanterns lit, and also from seeing my newborn baby, his toes all lined up like a row of sweet corn. We see her where we see her, which is everywhere. She comes to us through sound as well, through music, which vibrates the sternum, excites the heart. It comes through the drum, the whistle, the call and the cry. It comes through the written and the spoken word, Sometimes a word, a sentence or a poem or a story is so resonant, so right, it causes us to remember, at least for an instant, what substance, substance we are really made from and where is our true home. These trans, transient tastes of the wild come during the mystique of inspiration. Ah, there it is. Oh, now it's, it's gone. The longing for her comes when one happens across someone who has secured this wildest relationship. The longing comes when one realizes one has given scant time to the mystic cook fire or to the dream time. Too little time to one's own creative life, one's life work or one's true loves. Yet it is these fleeting tastes which come both through beauty as well as loss that calls us to become so bereft, so agitated, so longing, that we eventually must pursue the wildest nature. Then we leap into the forest, or into the desert, or into the snow, and run hard, our eyes scanning the ground, our bearing sharply tuned, searching under, searching over, searching for a clue, a remnant, a sign that she still lives, that we have not lost our chance. And when we pick up her trail, it is typical of women to ride hard to catch up, to clear off the desk, clear off the relationship, clear out one's mind, turn to a new page, insist on a break, break the rules, stop the world, for we are not going on without her any longer. Once women have lost her and then found her again, they will contend to keep her for good. Once they have regained her, they will flight and fight hard to keep her, for with her their creative lives blossom, their relationships gain meaning and depth and health, their cycles of sexuality, creativity, work and play are re-established. They are no longer marks for the predations of others. They are entitled equally under the laws of nature to grow and to thrive. Now their end of the day fatigue comes from satisfying work and endeavors, not from being shut up in too small a mindset, a job or a relationship. They know instinctively when things must die and when things must live. They know how to walk away. They know how to stay. When women reassert their relationship with the wildest nature, they are gifted with a permanent and internal watcher, a knower, a visionary, an oracle, an inspiratrice, an intuitive, a maker, a creator, an inventor, and a listener who guide, suggest and urge vibrant life in the inner and out outer worlds. When women are close to this nature, the fact of that relationship flows through, through them. This wild teacher, wild mother, wild mentor supports their inner and outer lives, no matter what.
So the word while here is not used in its modern pejorative sense, meaning out of control. But in its original sense, which means to live a natural life, one in which the creature, creature, creature has innate integrity and healthy boundaries. These words, wild and woman, cause women to remember who they are and what they are about. They create a metaphor to describe the force which finds all females. They personify a force that women cannot live without. The wild woman archetype can be expressed in other terms which are equally apt. You can call this powerful psychological nature the instinctive nature, but wild woman is the force which lies behind that. You can call it the natural psyche, but the archetype of the wild woman stands behind that as well. You can call it the innate, the basic nature of women. You can call it the indigenous, the intrinsic nature of women. In poetry, it might be called the other, or the seven oceans of the universe, or the far woods, or the friend. In various psycho psychologies, psychologies and from various perspectives, it would per perhaps be called the ID, the self, the medial nature. In biology, it would be called the typical or fundamental nature. But because it is tacit, prescient, prescient, and visceral <coughs> among cantadoras, it is called the wise or knowing nature. It is sometimes called the woman who lives at the end of time, or the woman who lives at the edge of the world. By the way, the name Hadrich or Hedwig means essentially a woman who lives near the edge, near the hedge of the village, which is around the village. She's a little bit outside of the community because she is a bit strange. She is watched as an eccentric woman, as a witch, but secretly in the night, women or even men and children go back to go visit her because she knows. She can heal, she knows about herbs. This is my own in-between. And this creature is always a creature hag, or a death goddess, or a maiden in descent, or any number of other personifications. She is both friend and mother to all those who have lost their way, all those who need a learning, all those who have a riddle to solve, all those out in the forest or the desert, wandering and searching. In actuality, in the psychoid unconscious, an ineffable layer of psyche from which the phenomenon as em emanates, wild woman has no name, for he is so she is so fast. But since this force and then genders, but since this force engenders every important facet of womanliness, womanliness here on earth, she is named many names, not only in order to peer into the myriad aspects of her nature, but also to hold on to her. Because in the beginning of retrieving our relationship with her, she can turn to smoke in an instant. By naming her, we create for her a territory of thought and feeling within us. Then she will come, and if valued, she will stay. So in Spanish I call her Rio Abajo Rio, the river beneath the river. La Mujer Grande, the great woman. Luz del Ambismo, the light from the abyss. La Loba, the wolf woman. Or La Oesera, the bone woman. She's called in Hungarian O Erdöben, she of the woods. And Rosso Mac, the wolverine. In, Navaja, in Navajo, Navajo. She is Naeshid Ajay, the spider woman who weaves the fate of humans and animals and plants and rocks. In Guatemala, among many other names, she is Umana del Niebla, the mist being, the woman who has lived forever. In Japanese, she is Amaterasu Omikame.